described as the language of the soul. It's evolved through thousands of generations, but continues to evoke feelings, memories, and experiences that often can't be expressed through words. So how is it that sound, a mechanical radiant energy transmitted through pressure waves, can be arranged in a melodic manner that draws emotion out of us? Music has such an immense influence on us as children and into adulthood. But today I want to explore its significance on life before birth by asking this question. Can prenatal music exposure impact development? Let's begin by defining the difference between music and noise. Music is defined as sounds that are arranged in a way that is pleasant or exciting to listen to, whereas noise is a sound that is loud or unpleasant or that causes disturbance. Now, these definitions become slightly controversial when we step into the realm of heavy metal music, but we'll leave that untouched for now and deem volume our guide for differentiating the two. According to the Ontario government, 85 decibels is deemed the max exposure limit to sound in the workplace. While it would be unethical to induce disruptive sound on human babies for research, an exploratory study was done on pregnant mothers already exposed to noise over this limit during their eight hour work shifts. The children born from these mothers showed a threefold increase in the risk of having high frequency hearing loss and significant increase in the risk of hearing loss at frequencies of 4,000 Hertz when exposures involved a strong component of low frequency noise. So noise can cause hearing loss, which has impacts on development, but maybe that's something that was already inferred. My question is probing more at the impacts music has on development. That leads into our first point being prenatal music exposure leads to hippocampal neurogenesis. There was a study conducted in Korea where a group of rats was divided into three different groups. A music group, a noise group, and a control group. On the 15th day of pregnancy, until the rats gave birth, they were stimulated with their respective sounds for an hour a day. The music group was exposed to 65 decibels of comfortable music. The noise group was exposed to 95 decibels of uncomfortable sound and the control group was left undisturbed. Following the testing conditions and 21 days after birth, the rat pups were deprived of water and placed in a radial arm maze to test their spatial learning abilities. The test was completed when the pup had successfully found the water in all eight arms of the maze. Errors were tallied if they visited an arm that they had already entered. The researchers were testing for differences in weight, spatial memory, and hippocampal neurogenesis. The noise group had lower body weight, while the music and control group showed no significant differences between one another. The music exposed group completed the test significantly faster than the control group, and almost double the speed of the noise exposed group. The music group also made the least amount of errors by re-entering the same arm twice, with the noise group making a significant amount of errors. Overall, the music group proved to be the most successful when tested for spatial memory. Lastly, researchers removed and observed the brains of the rat pups, identifying increased neurogenesis in the hippocampi of the music exposed group, even compared to the control group. The noise exposed group displayed significant reductions of neurogenesis in their hippocampi. An almost identical study was conducted with the same sound exposures, except this time they were testing for increases in neurogenesis in the somatosensory and motor cortex. The findings were the same, with the music exposed rats having increases in neurogenesis and the noise exposed rats having decreases. These findings suggest the importance of protecting fetuses from noisy environments, as well as shed some light on how music exposure can improve and enhance brain development. So we've tested this on rats, but let's look at an ethical way of studying this in humans where we don't expose the babies to noise, but rather expose them to just music. A study conducted in Italy tested 32 women between 32 to 38 weeks pregnant. Data collection was done using an electrocardiograph placed on the maternal abdomen and Claire de Lune was used as the musical stimulus. The breakdown of the testing went like this. Five minutes of data was collected before the music was played. Then there was a 10 minute period of musical stimulation where Claire de Lune was played. And then lastly, there was five minutes of data collected after the music stopped playing. Surprising to some, the results showed no change in the mean value of the heart rate. And while music had no impact on fetal heart rate, it did have impact on fetal heart rate variability. Heart rate is the amount of times the heart beats per minute, whereas heart rate variability is the variation in time between each of those beats. Heart rate variability best reflects the interaction between your sympathetic nervous system, your flight or fight response, and your parasympathetic nervous system, your rest and digest or relaxed response. An increase in heart rate variability is most closely associated with an increase in mainly the activation of the parasympathetic system, whereas a decrease in heart rate variability is most closely associated with an increased activation of the sympathetic system. 
Let's start with comparing the noticeable changes in the first five minutes of quiet compared to the musical stimulation phase. Fetal heart rate variability statistically increased during the musical stimulation phase, and this was tracked through CVI or the cardiac vagal index. In contrast, there was no significant changes in the activation of components from the sympathetic system. Researchers found that despite the music ending, there was still continued increase in parasympathetic activity. This occurred because at the same time, there were significant decreases in LFN, a low frequency band controlled by sympathetic activation. This parallel increase of parasympathetic activation and decrease of sympathetic activation led to the significant increase in heart rate variation. This study showed that prenatal music exposure can reduce stress not only while the music is playing, but following it as well. This is important because stress-induced exposures have been proven to affect the health, development, and long-term function of the infant. Music can be used as a safe tool for fetal therapy as it's also non-invasive. Now you may be asking yourself, are fetuses even capable of hearing? Can they detect a difference between a melody and just a sound? This brings me to one final study and my last point. Prenatal exposure to music impacts auditory processing. Fetal onset to hearing has been said to develop as early as 27 weeks gestational age. A group of pregnant mothers played several melodies, one which included Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, in their homes for five times a week from the time the fetuses were 29 weeks until birth. A control group was also tested and these babies did not receive any musical stimulation. Both groups were tested as newborns and then four months later using the same melody, as well as a changed melody where a few notes were varied. Responses were then determined using ERPs, also known as event-related potentials. Infants who had learned the melody as fetuses showed significantly stronger ERPs than the control group, both at birth and four months of age. Additionally, correlation showed the more an infant had heard the melody as a fetus, the larger the strength of their reaction to the sounds were. Results also showed that both groups responded to a change in the melody, which brought about an interesting interpretation of the data. This study provides insight into how prenatal music exposure has positive impacts on auditory processing, as the greater the exposure to the melody, the stronger the response. Additionally, both groups reacting to the change in melody may be reflective of the physical differences between the notes causing the detection of change in melody, not the previous exposure to the melody. Musical stimulation can therefore increase neural responsiveness to sounds and have long-term effects on the developing brain, but infants did not display any capability of detecting cognitive changes in melody. To conclude, prenatal music exposure does have significant effects on fetal development, specifically in auditory processing and brain growth. Research shows that music can promote neurogenesis, enhance memory and learning, and reduce stress by calming the fetus. Additionally, exposure to familiar melodies improves auditory responses in infants. These findings highlight the potential benefits of music as a non-invasive tool to support cognitive and emotional development before birth. Researching how musical exposure early on in life could impact or influence a child to pursue music later in life would be a topic of research I would be curious to pursue next.